I wanted to save the next part here till Terry came up and just before he, he would um, speak to mention this book, Christ the Controversialist, that he edited when he was an instructor at the Florida School of Preaching some years ago. This is the only one he has, but I told him a moment ago, this is one we can try to take and put into uh, electronic format. Very good book. It approaches things from the standpoint of being able to teach in a, tr a classroom, as well as a lot of things we've covered here. So you might look forward to that as we try to put that together. He's going to speak to us on... Uh, Christ confronted error about the Father. Uh, let me urge you to do a general study and a deep study of what the Bible teaches about the great Godhead. And uh, when you do, you will concern yourself with the study of the first person of the Godhead or the Father. Brother Hightower was born in Winter Haven, Florida. He's the grandson of an evangelist, W.M. Barton, wife of Vicki that's been already mentioned and uh, daughter Casey, son Brett, grandsons Bragan, Brantley, and they have already begun to teach, and I, it's wonderful to hear that. Granddaughters Madeline and Ella. He's preached in Arkansas, Florida, Wyoming, Texas. He's done Bible chair work in Florida and Wyoming. He's honors graduate from Polk Community College and Harding with uh, graduate school with a master's uh, of arts in apologetics, and uh, studied under the late brother and beloved Thomas B. Warren, arranged the watson matson debate, which uh, uh, between Flew and Matson, if you will study those debates, you'll be pretty well armed <laughs> to meet an atheist. Uh, was a Florida School of Preaching instructor with emphasis in logic, hermeneutics, and Christian evidences. And he's the author of, uh, or editor of this book, and then author of the book, The Case for the Christian Policeman. And the books that he was involved in and the lectureships uh, when he directed the Shenandoah lectureship down in San Antonio, some seven of them were very good books. I don't know how they're still available, uh, but if you can find any of the books, especially those that he edited, you'll do yourself well to have them in your library and to study them, of course. He's been involved in youth camps and open forums, a debate moderators, debated the war question. Oh, and let me mention this. I will not call the name. You can if you want to. He mentioned debating the war question. Well, his opponent some years later was over in Russia, and his opponent was saying that, you know, you can under no circumstances defend yourself. <laughs> but he thought he was about to be attacked by some hooligans on the street, and he told this on himself. And before he knew it, he had grabbed a Coke bottle and was ready to fight. And there's the winner of the debate. Uh, the truth. The truth won. But that goes to show you kind of how some things work. We're glad to have him with us. He's a member of the church uh, meeting at Bushland, Texas. And we'll come here, Terry, speak. Christ confronted error about the Father. Brother Terry. I did want to thank at the very beginning before I started my lesson uh, to give my uh, thanks to Gene and Joy Litke for putting up with Gary Summers and myself the last uh, few days and uh, they simply have exhibited uh, as all of you have marvelous uh, hospitality. Although I, I will say that this is the first time uh, that I ever stayed with a brother who is so bald on the top of his head that he has to carry his dandruff around in his hand. Uh, I just thought we'd get that in there for, for Gene, and I'm sure he will come back with something uh, as he's been doing the last several days. Uh, the other thing is I got a phone call from Gary's wife, uh, Barbara, and uh, as usual, she was in tears. And... Uh, <laughs> And she knew I was staying with him. And she says, Terry, I'm really having a trouble, really bad trouble with a Bible question. And I said, what is it? I could hardly understand her through, you know, the usual blubbering, but I've gotten used to it. Um, and she says, I'm really having trouble, Terry, believing in God's providence. And I said, you know, how so, Barbara? And she says, well, I've come to this conclusion, uh, Brother Hightower. She said, no person really decides before they grow up 
I've decided this. No person ever decides but when they, before they grow up who they're going to marry. She says, God decides it, you know, way all the uh, way before that. And she, has, uh, she said that then you get to find out later who you're stuck with. <laughs> so if you can remember her and remember Barbara Summers in your prayers. Also, Joy, Joy Litke, because she has to clean up the dandruff. Never mind. Uh, uh, that will be a good thing. <clears throat> Jesus uh, confronted error about the Father. Uh, Jesus, though he was gracious and loving, obviously, he always uh, produced chaos. When you really study his life like we have uh, the last several days, and I hope you study, continue to study the chapters in this book, he always produced chaos as he rejected the status quo. He did not just accept things as they uh, were. Uh, he was deeply spiritual, but yet without being either a Stoic or a mystic, which were both very popular options during Jesus' day. Stoic philosophy revolved around logic and discipline, and, and yet the, the passionate Jesus, he strode through the villages and the towns of the first century Palestine with a life-changing love and offering transformation, don't you see, uh, to all through a devoted love for his Father. That's what it was really, I would say, all about. Uh, Jesus did not display the mystical spirituality of a monastic cell or circular mazes and or chanted prayers. You've got to go to ACU uh, to get some of that, uh, or maybe Lipscomb now. Uh, but anyway, Christ's devotion was to, to his Father was instead, it was energetic, it was forceful, uh, and as seen in the way that we've already presented in the other speech, uh, the way he knocked twice, knocked over the money changers' tables in the temple, and he proclaimed woes against the arrogant Jewish educators of his day whom people, the average person, thought was up here, when in reality, as far as their strict knowledge and practice of the Bible, was way down here or non-existent. Uh, and he stared down the priestly leaders and the Roman rulers on his way uh, to the cross. Well, uh, I just wanted to point out a few things today then about uh, what does G Christ tell us about the Father. In his confrontations with people of his day, what does he tell us about the, the Father? Uh, one book that I've already mentioned called, entitled The Greatest Words Ever Spoken uh, makes this claim. It says this, Jesus spoke more words about God the Father and his intimate relationship with the Father than he did about any other subject. Now, I haven't really checked that out exactly uh, numerically you know, or quantitatively to try to figure it out, but I think it could be very true. He said, as you prayerfully, this person said, as you prayerfully read these verses that he has pulled together from the New Testament, he says, notice the love and the adoration that the Son has for the Father. Notice Jesus' perfect obedience and his driving desire to serve, to please, and glorify his Heavenly Father. And amazingly, and I thought this was a great statement by this uh, Stephen Scott, he said, amazingly, this is the truest picture of the kind of relationship that God desires to have with us. Isn't that right? Think about that. Uh, through the terrible and glorious atoning sacrifice of Jesus on Calvary, uh, he, uh, we too can have an intimate, fulfilling relationship with our Heavenly Father. Uh, and the fact is, he taught not only by his verbiage, by his words, uh, but he taught by what he did. He said that he that, this is John 12, verse 44, and he said, He that believeth on me believeth not on me, uh, but on him that sent me. Uh, and he that beholdeth me beholdeth him that sent me. He went on to say, and he that sent me is with me. It's from John 8, uh, 29. He said, and he that sent me is with me. Imagine the audacity of that claim. Uh, he hath not left me alone, Jesus said, for I always do the, uh, the things that are pleasing to him. Uh, which of you, he said a little later, Verse 46, I believe, he said, which of you convicteth me of sin? Wow. Uh, this is a person who was either had something wrong with him or was mentally off or he was who he said that he was. And I'll let you then 
Uh, it's up to you to decide from the evidence about that from the New Testament. And so it's very educational then to see how Jesus confronted error. I hope you've seen that the last several days. Uh, either by word or by actions of what he did. Uh, and about, especially to do, in my case, this afternoon about the Father. And in fact, we see in Matthew 4, verses 1 through 11, where Satan enters the ring, you know, for a second try. We see concerning Jesus then, uh, and tempting Jesus, he endeavors to use something that just occurred there right before, immediately prior. Uh, and by Jesus making that statement about his reliance upon every word, you know, that proceeds out of the mouth of God uh, the Father in order to get him to sin. And of course, Jesus answered him. Because uh, he, he quotes from Psalm 91, and he ends up saying, of course, and use, misusing it, but he says, uh, If thou, he set him on the pinnacle temple and saith unto him, you remember, he said, If thou art the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, he shall give, and it is written just from Scripture, uh, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and on their hands, he said, they, uh, shall they bear thee up, lest haply thou dash thy foot, he's, uh, the devil said, against a stone. And Jesus, you'll remember, looked him in the eye, uh, straight in the eye of Satan, and he said, again, it is written, which means that Scripture must be taken as a sum or a totality, as we often reiterate. Again, it is written. And then he quotes from a completely different book, from Deuteronomy 6 and verse 16, a book of law, and not the poetry of Psalm 91, which is exactly as I point out in the chapter, as what well, many liberals in the Lord's church today said you must not do. Because it's awful. You're drawing inferences. It's almost a curse word for these people to say N-I, which stands for necessary inference. Uh, or implication, really, is what we should be saying. Uh, the inference of a person, you or me or any other human, occurs here in our minds. It doesn't matter whether you infer or I infer anything about the Bible so far as what it actually teaches. It teaches uh, either by direct statements or by implication, from which we then infer in putting uh, scriptures together and drawing proper, reasonable, logical conclusions, following the rules of inference and so forth about it. It says what it says by implication or in any other way, whatever it teaches. Uh, it says what it says hundreds of years before you and I were ever here on this earth. It teaches objective, absolute uh, truth, don't you see? But Jesus does just what these people say in their new hermeneutic that you ought not to do. Uh, it's just really dangerous. I've had them tell me that. And in writing, certainly in their writings they say it, dangerous to go from the book of poetry, say, Psalm 91, uh, over to a book of law, Deuteronomy 6 and verse 16, and then put those together and say, this verse modifies what you're trying to pervert this into, and he's implying then ultimately the sum of thy word is truth, as Psalm 119 verse 160, uh, American Standard Version says. Over and over again we see that Jesus, I hope you've seen this the last uh, couple of days, uh, over and over again we see that Jesus did not bypass the mind uh, to speak to the heart. Let me say that again. He did not bypass the mind to speak to the heart. Uh, like those who think that Christian faith is really uh, what I just call existentialism. Uh, well, uh, while it's not necessary to be able to use the logical symbols uh, like I'm doing and put, put in the book there for you, it's on page 192 if you're looking at the book this, this afternoon, uh, it's not necessary to know these symbols, but I'll tell you what is required. I think you ought to go ahead and learn the symbols. It makes it easier to really to follow. But it is required that you or anyone who uh, is accountable before God, it is required that one understand at least the words, the logic of, uh, concerning what's going on here. In a nutshell, Satan's argument in Matthew 4 and his error, you see, amounted to the following. He's really arguing this. If you are the son of God, he's saying to Jesus here, uh, who really trusts in God's word, then you'll rely on the Father's word in Psalm 91, verses 1 and 2, by casting yourself off the top of the temple. And I put that in symbolic uh, logic for you. Uh, and really, it's a shorthand. It's like, you know, doing math. Imagine trying to multiply, Brother Warren used to say this, imagine trying to multiply 14,786 times uh, a, a similar length of a number 
and do it in words only. <laughs> Try it sometime. <laughs> It's much easier. And that's why you ought to get a, just a good standard type logic book or maybe two or three of them and read that and then you'll start seeing how the scriptures and what's happening here. Jesus was not only the great physician, uh, he was the great logician as we've tried to emphasize the last few days. But anyway, the minor premise from the devil was this. Uh, of course, Jesus maintained that major premise. If you're a son of God and really trust Psalm 91, you'll, you know, uh, uh, you'll rely on the Father's word, according to the devil, and cast yourself off the top of the temple. Jesus said, no, that's false. Uh, but the minor premise uh, Jesus agreed with, uh, you are the son of God and really trust in God's word. Jesus didn't deny that. He would agree with it. But then he said, therefore, though, the devil is saying, you will rely on the Father's word from Psalm 91, verses 1 and 2, by casting yourself off the top of the temple. And Jesus, of course, falsified this by refuting the major premise uh, in the devil's argument. And you can do that, brethren, if you, if you think a little bit and study a little bit of this, and you will understand it will enhance your Bible study, and your interpretive skills ability will go way up if you understand the logic of Jesus Christ or the logic of the Father and the Holy Spirit and, of course, what the Scriptures are really all about. Prove all things, hold fast to that which is good, 1 Thessalonians 5.21 by Paul. Other verses like Isaiah 1.18 come to mind. Come now, let us reason uh, together. Uh, and that really is what it's uh, all about. Well, I'm going to skip a few things there, but we'll just say that going into this dispute with Satan, uh, Jesus already uh, knew this. He knew that Satan already absolutely knew who he was. So why worry with that? And I'm skipping a few things we put uh, in the book. Uh, but Psalm 91, uh, there, verses 1 and 2, applied generally to all believers and not especially to his credentials as the Messiah. The devil's doing a little cherry picking here, don't you see? Just because someone quotes on the radio or television or any other place, quotes the Bible to you, does not mean he or she are, are people of God, people of true Bible faith. Here's Satan quoting scripture. Imagine that. Uh, the promises of God, as we've said, are not to be isolated, uh, but rather scripture modifies scripture in that the surface first glance meaning of one verse that can be revised or amended or qualified by other verses from God's word. And no verse, let's stress this, and Jesus knew this, that no verse is to be used by man for any foolish show-off type testing of God himself, which would contradict other Bible verses, as Jesus showed from Deuteronomy 6 and verse 16. And, of course, it's certain that I believe that Jesus also knew that the devil, if you go back and look at it carefully, he left off part of the verse. He left off part of Psalm 91. And, and namely, he left off the phrase that was originally in the verse. He dropped it out, which says, To keep thee in all thy ways, which should then cause God's uh, follower uh, to remember that our ways are to be like his ways. And the devil conveniently dropped that out. You see, in other words, ways that are authorized by him and not somebody like Satan or Satan's followers, uh, as, as demonstrated then handily in the book context of Psalm 91. And I've given you uh, some other uh, of that context in the book if you want to look at it and study that out a little more. Jumping from the pinnacle of the temple would be an effort to force the Father, don't you see, to work on uh, Jesus' terms instead of his following the Father's terms, what the Father had willed and said. And so again, uh, in quoting Deuteronomy 6.16, Christ shows that to purposefully put oneself in a dangerous position in order to prove that the Father cares for us not only foolish, but it's sinful. Uh, would that modern day... Uh, Snake hand, po handling poisonous snake handlers would, would learn, uh, the snake handlers handling poisonous snakes uh, would learn this truth. Uh, and though Satan's arguments cleverly put in a valid form, this is what you want to see logically, it's in a valid form. That helps camouflage it. It doesn't just necessarily leap off the page then or his oral presentation to Jesus. But Jesus, of course, being the great logician he was, uh, even though it's put in a valid form, that means it, it, it's in accord with rules of inference then. 
uh, and with full knowledge of him by the truth about the truth of the minor premise that you are the son of God really trust in God's word Jesus agreed as I said with that but Christ zeroes in and this is what logic will help you do in study in scripture he zeroes in on and he falsifies the major premise which in turn falsifies of course the conclusion well uh, again, it's our different genres of scripture really taboo like our liberal brethren say? No, it's not. How do I know Jesus our Savior used uh, it in exactly the way uh, that we still can and carefully done studying verses, of course, in context, in uh, Bible or, in fact, book context, Old Testament, New Testament. If you want to know what's going on, whether it's law or poetry or prophecy or whatnot, uh, and, and, uh, and yet, still, he did exactly the, uh, what they say uh, is so dangerous and ought not to be done. Well, if it was, why did our Savior, you know, operate that way? Well, uh, again, they have a great fear of human deductions becoming binding conclusions. And yet, since the scripture you want to notice nowhere explicitly affirms these liberal brethren's conclusion about that, they quite obviously then deduced it. They inferred it from a supposed uh, proper deduction, I guess they would have to say. And again, uh, what I'm following in principle, Jesus' typical debate rejoinder, we would ask this of our liberal brethren. If we, by Beelzebub, use deduction, in other words, inference, by whom do your sons of academia use it? Where, how did, where did you get it from? Therefore, as Jesus said on one occasion, another situation, but it's parallel Therefore, they shall be your judges. That's in Matthew 12, and verse 27. And you compare Paul's use of the similar principle in Romans 2, verses 18 through 22. Well, again, uh, like one person, I want to be, you got to be careful here and not make a wrongful ad hominem to the person argument, uh, but I would agree with uh, one man's observation. He said this, the fallacy of double standard very often stems from too high a view of ourselves and our causes and our argumentation and an unfair prejudice against competing views or ideas. Well, I'll let others upholding the old hermeneutic of direct statements, implication, and example decide for themselves if our own new hermeneutic or type brethren fit into any of these causes being involved in their special plea. Well, let's just say that if you do not see this, you need to listen and read more after these new, new hermeneutic brethren. And let us say then to our her, new hermeneutic brothers, any listening to me over the internet or if they ever read this in the book, you need to examine your argumentation more carefully to see if you are upholding a self-contradictory or self-refuting doctrine. That's exactly what you need to do. Now, if you don't understand what a self-refuting or self-contradictory doctrine is it would be like me saying this sentence, Gary Summers and these other handsome brethren. That's a self-refuting statement in and of itself. It's obvious. Did you get it? Uh, Gary Summers and other uh, handsome brethren. That's contradictory inherently to make that statement. So just don't tell Gary. Uh, well, again, the debating Jesus knows a self-refuting double standard when he, when he sees it, and he's not going to let them see these people get, escape and get by with that, and as he says there in Matthew 12, 27, uh, and you'll see that uh, principle. The fact is that uh, the, logically our Lord allowed, would make, and give no free passes to anybody. And if there was ever a man who would make a wall and stand in the gap before the Father, Ezekiel 22, verse 30, it was Christ is that man. Well, again, uh, we know uh, my mother used to do this, that she would say, my grandfather, her father was a gospel preacher, and she would like to always inform me off and on uh, when she was still alive. She died in 1990. But she would inform me that my grandfather, her father, did not have didn't use much more for sermon preparation than a King James Bible, she would say to me, and, and uh, she was seeing my growing library, you understand, and she would say he didn't use anything really much more that carried than a King James Version Bible and Gene Hill's Cruden con Concordance. <laughs> hint, hint, Terry, hint, hint about your library, but uh, 
I appreciated her comments in an age where people had gotten off and doing those Reader's Digest sermons. Uh, and, you know, a lot of Reader's Digest uh, illustrations and things, but precious few scriptures. And lots of snappy stories and jokes and so forth for sheer entertainment. But unfortunately for my own mother, uh, Paul warned us about those who would make spoil of us through their, their philosophy... Uh, this is in Colossians 2.8, and vain deceit after the traditions of men, uh, after the rudiments of the world, not after Christ. Would this not entail at least then a minimum uh, understanding of prevalent false philosophies? Many of you preachers listening to me right now have heard this from brethren. You know, why don't you just preach the Bible and not get into the stuff about this person's belief and this person's philosophy and, and all that? Well, wait a minute. When I study the scripture, did not Paul marvelously deal with the supposedly learned Epicurean and Stoic philosophers on Mars Hill in Athens by expertly knowing their beliefs to the point of quoting from their own poets in Acts 17, verses 18 through 29? And the answer is yes, he did. Was that wrong then? Uh, how did Paul know exactly what to quote from one of uh, Crete's false teachers? In Titus 1.12, about all Cretans are liars. He didn't get that from the Bible somewhere back earlier in the Old Testament. No, he, he as I've al already mentioned in my other uh, lesson, uh, it's like that preaching involves having uh, a newspaper in effect in my left hand and God's word in, the, in my right. And that is not wrong. Do you think Jesus didn't know what these Pharisees and Sadducees taught about certain things? You know, just, Jesus just studied the Bible and that's it. Well, yeah, he studied the Bible as God's word, and that's the only place you can get that. But he knew what they taught, don't you see? And he had to learn that uh, from, uh, not by osmosis, but he had to be aware. He was conscious. He, he was truly a human being just like us. And again, uh, Brother Warren used to drill into us as students, you know, and he would show to us and he, he would say, uh, how philosophy, just like Paul said in Colossians 2.8, leads theology around by the nose. Well, while at the same time, of course, Brother Warren stressed that saving faith derives only from the scripture, Romans 10.17. But you need to think that out. Before you're critical of your preacher, uh, you need to think that out, and it's not going to jive. It's not going to fit with God's word, as I very quickly demonstrated uh, there. Well, He's dealing with these Sadducees. We've heard a lot about that the last few days concerning Exodus 3, verse 6. But I want you to notice that when Jesus answered the uh, Sadducees there, when they set out their argumentation for their erroneous doctrine of no resurrection, like in Mark 12 and verse 18, uh, that uh, I think it's enthymematic. In other words, there's an assumed but not overtly stated background premise that we need to bring out that they know about. And that is Christ's doctrine of one man for one woman for life except for adultery. Put that in there. Matthew 5, 32 and Matthew 19, 9. And I think you'll understand it better what they're saying. That in the afterlife, here's this deal, you know, where the woman has had all these a serial a, a number of, uh, of uh, husbands. And so whose wife will she be in the resurrection? Knowing all full well that Jesus taught us one man for one woman for life. And then how this all this bizarre, chaotic situation supposedly is going to be implied in the afterlife. But Jesus went underneath their surface error, which was not understanding implication in Exodus 3, verse 6. But he went under that to their philosophical underpinnings. Well, you see, when he said, you do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. That's where their real problem, you see, uh, was. Well, again... The Sadducees were mostly uh, educated, wealthy, and aristocratic, and resident in Jerusalem. And I would say to our own liberals in the Brotherhood, who are mostly educated, wealthy, aristocratic, and resident in Abilene, Nashville, and Mal or Malibu. And that's what Jesus would say, I believe, to them uh, today. And as you look at Luke 20, verses 37 and 38, but it's their ignorance of or their philosophical bias toward the power of God uh, is what the problem was really with the Sadducees. 
And there's a striking relevance uh, to people even uh, today, especially in liberal uh, quarters. It doesn't seem to have occurred to the Sadducees that God could create another order of being, a new and a different life in which earth's in supposedly insoluble problems would be solved. They underestimated the power of deity. And, of course, I would say, Barbara Summers, if you are listening today, just remember that there's going to be another order of being and a new and different life, and you will not be stuck with you-know-who for the rest of the afterlife. You're going to be okay, Barbara. Hang in there. It's going to change. In the twinkling of an eye, it'll be taken care of. Well... Uh, you remember Jesus, of course, the, the, the sons of this world marry and are given in marriage, but they that are accounted worthy to attain to that world uh, and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. This is Luke 20. Uh, for neither can they die anymore, for they are equal unto the angels and are sons of God being sons of the resurrection. What's your view of God? Is he infinite? Is he omnipotent? Uh, is he omniscient? Who is he? That's what the Bible is about to let you know. Uh, about that. Jesus goes for the juggler there and uh, the underlying metaphysical uh, ideology back of it, the power of God. You don't have the right view of God. And again, we know for the Jews to fail here is as we've listed scriptures in the chapter uh, is to fail miserably, is to eliminate themselves from even the possibility of salvation because you have to know who God is, you have to know who Christ is to confess who he is. Do you have to, am I saying you have to know everything? Brother Hightower, are you saying you have to know and be omniscient and know everything about Jesus? No, but you have to know who he is and, and not violate the law of identity as to who he is. That's why Mormonism, they, they teach a false situation of who God is. Many religious groups do. Many people don't even know that. You have to go under their surface teaching because they may use the words Father, Son, and Holy Spirit but they do not mean what the Bible actually teaches about the Father, Son, and uh, Holy Spirit. And when one errs, is, is in error in regard to the very def definition of who God is to the point of even denying, I will say, even one of his primary attributes, that's parallel to worshiping a false deity. Why, why would it be any different? Again, here's the Sadducees. This involves the Sadducees' error about the Father. If God is omnipotent, then there can be a resurrection of the dead. Sadducees denied the resurrection of the dead. But if God is omnipotent, there can, there can be a resurrection from the dead. It is false that God is omnipotent. That's what they actually held. That's, here's the real problem. And then the conclusion, therefore, there can be no resurrection of the dead. But don't you see? The, even though the argument's in valid uh, in fat form inferentially, uh, so that if they can prove the premises to be true, the conclusion will follow, the fact is, though, uh, the major premise is true, but the minor premise is false. It's false that God is omnipotent. No, it's false that it's false that God is omnipotent, which means what? He is omnipotent. Remember your math class? The two negatives equal a what? It's a positive. Well, again, whether you know the symb symbols, we're not saying you have to know that. You don't have to have a degree. I've had some tell me, oh, you're saying, you and Brother Warren and others, you're saying you have to have a degree in logic in order to go to heaven. No, but you have to be logical. You have to be logical. <clears throat> and the better, the better that you understand that, uh, the more then uh, the privilege and opportunity to learn who God really is and how much he uh, cares for each one of us. Well, uh, I'm going to go over, uh, kind of just pass over some of the material uh, which we asked the question, can one please the Father without knowing Jesus? The Jews were really fouled up about that. They thought they could know the Father and obey and go to heaven and be okay when here's Jesus here in front of them who was the Messiah that they claimed to be looking for all these hundreds of years. Uh, does the Father reveal himself to the proud or to the humble? Well, my answer is, and I hope yours is, from Scripture, it's only to the humble, not to the proud. And these people were not that. They were proud. Uh, and if one is blind to Christ, can one attain unto eternal life? Well, uh, no, you cannot. And again, notice some of the argumentation. We've tried to help you a little bit with some of the symbols there. Uh, and once you kind of get into understanding a little of this, it makes things really a whole lot easier. It makes things easier to follow and to understand. 
Well, I deal with some of their outward behavior about their outward biblical ritualism and so forth. But inwardly, of course, being uh, full of dead men's bones, as Jesus, of course, uh, pointed out against them. But And the last point I'd like to make as we're coming to a close in this lesson, I'll just say this. Is God, is God distant from us and unforgiving, or is he like a loving father? And I think some of the Jews, you see here, uh, have missed this. Uh, they tended, Sadducees especially, to be somewhat humanistic uh, about God and about everything. It seems that many Jews in the Lord's time held the air about God being distant and uncooperative to the point that not only does he hope you fail, God's out to get you. And many people think of God as this celestial Scrooge who sits in the sky with the big stick and that every time you get out of line as a human, whack, 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 he's after you. He clobbers you. But over and over again, Jesus logically, he clobbered that notion, didn't he, about the Father. That is not true. And I'll say to you young people, you need to realize this. You need to see God's not out here. He's not a God who just wants to spoil your fun. I think many of us have to come and study that, think that out, and realize that's not God. Uh, would God forgive an adulterous woman? All you have to do is read Scripture like in John 8, verses 3 through 11. And the answer is, yes, he will forgive her. And we have a whole section, you know, uh, dealing with uh, that. Uh, God is much more like Joseph, Jesus' earthly father, who, who showed what he th- when he thought that Mary had committed adultery, he showed his true colors. It says in uh, Matthew 1, 19, that Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man, that means he was like God. He was a, being a righteous man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. He didn't want her to get stoned to death, you see. He was, he's like God in that particular aspect. Well, again, uh, uh, would God forgive a prodigal son and a spiteful, self-righteous older brother if they would repent, come back to him? Yes. We know that from Jesus' story, of course, uh, concerning, as we call it, the prodigal son. I'd say the prodigal son and elder brother. And this last parable there shows us that God, the Father, is, uh, is not aloof nor disinterested in our activities here on the earth. Maybe you had an earthly father. Uh, I'm sure that you had a great one, that's what I should say. You had a great earthly father. Or maybe you'd say your dad wasn't quite as involved as you would have liked. Maybe you felt he was like he was a little distant or disengaged from you. Whether you had the best father or one who disappointed you, our heavenly father is simply the greatest father who ever lived. He's the standard for all fathers universally. Uh, and Jesus told just to show how great a father we have in God the Father, he gave that story, set forth that story of the parable uh, of, and we entitle it, the prodigal son, or you could say the parable of the lost son. Well, again, I don't think either one of those titles is accurate enough because really it's a story, as I said, about two sons and both are important. But anyway, the most important player in that story is not either of the two sons, but it's the most important player in the story is the father. And go back and reread that, study that out, and you'll see that. And that you see that uh, at the end, the Bible records his return this way. And he arose and came to his father, but while he was yet afar off, the father saw him and was moved with compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him, and the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, uh, and in thy sight I am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth quickly, quickly the best robe, and put it on him, put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat, and make merry. For this my son was dead, and is alive again. He was lost, and is found. They began to be merry. Well, you think about that, and I hope you'll read this entire section that we set forth there. Uh, much of it that I gave there is not from originally from me, but you know, here's what the it's sort of like this. If the story was set in this century, it, he, Jesus might have said that you know the father heard rumors along this line. You know, he's run off, he's taken the money and, and hit the road, and he's given it up about the church and so forth. And your son has wrecked his car. Uh, he's smoking weed. He's running around with loose women. He's a, he's at frat parties. He's He's running up debt. Why he, won't he even robbed the liquor store last week. You imagine being a dad or father and hearing things like that? And many of us sometimes do, don't we? But unlike regular dad, human dads, 
the Heavenly Father is portrayed there by Jesus as this patient uh, person, loving person, and he's giving you as much time as you need to finally come to your senses and come back to him. I hope you go back there and read that. But here's what the Father didn't do there. He loved his son enough not to interrupt his downward purposeful spiral. Probably everything in him wanted to intervene, just like we as human parents, human fathers or mothers want to do. But he likely wanted to come uh, to the son's rescue, especially if he heard that his son out here was going hungry. But, hey, I know I gave you what was your son, but here's a little more. It, it's ridiculous for you to be working over there at that pig farm. Uh, please come home. But his father loved him enough to wait, and he waited him out, according to Jesus, in this parable. Uh, <coughs> you can almost picture him standing at the edge of town every day, gazing off into the distance, looking for that son to come home. Well, <coughs> that's what Jesus wants us to picture here. And he's thinking, I wonder if today is going to be the day when my son comes home. I wonder if today he's going to come to his senses and come on home. I wonder if today is the day when he realizes that a bad day at my house is better <coughs> excuse me, than a good day in his sin. Well, think about that, what Jesus is saying in this parable. Uh, will it be today? Every day he strains, the father strains his hands over his eyes looking into the distance. Is that him? Is that him in the distance? And we could say today to you, in closing this lesson, that God is still waiting for those who haven't yet come home, either initially to obey the gospel or, <coughs> excuse me, or to come back to him if you are a prodigal. A son or daughter, and you're prodigal, God is waiting and looking for you. <coughs> With God, Jesus is saying, there is always hope. <coughs> those of you who are parents like I am, or wishing right now your daughter would come home or that your son would come back. And yet what? You resist it. But look at what Jesus is portraying here. He loves you. He wants you to come home. He wants you to respond to the, to the invitation. And again, this is what Jesus is teaching us about the Father. And many Jews had, had moved away from understanding that about the Father. Let me just say this as I, as I close here uh, before we extend an invitation, I'm assuming, uh, there with the song. Uh, the Jews, some of them had forgotten <coughs> such verses as Micah chapter 7. I don't think I put this in the book. But look with me at, uh, as we close at Micah 7, beginning at verse 18 and reading the next verse. They forgot this. Who is a God like you? hardening iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. Who is a God like that? And he said, he does not retain his anger forever. I've seen some fathers and mothers who are human, and they seemingly just about do that. They won't, they, I'll never forgive him. I'll never forgive her. That's not God the Father. Because he delights in mercy, Micah says, he will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. Do you believe that today? You need to be baptized for remission of sins. Won't you do that? Come home. Come home if you are a wayward uh, Christian. Young or old, middle-aged, it doesn't matter. Won't you respond right now this morning as we stand and as we sing this song?